morning. Just walking Phoebe down by the Fal here in this place called Trolistic, which is really lovely. But that's the Fal estuary you can just see between the trees here, or it leads out to the Fal estuary anyway, which is great. It's very cold here today though. But I'm thinking about um, metaphor, and particularly it's this thing called compression. Compression is, um, I can't remember the name of the guy who's talked about it actually, but there's a good video on YouTube which describes it, so I'll see if I can find a link. But what he's basically saying is that one of the, fa one, of the um, uh, one of the faculties that we use in order to be able to kind of understand the world around us, particularly the more abstract aspects of it, of course is metaphor, but we use this particular te technique he calls compression, by which he means that when we make a, a metaphorical image of something, or a metonymic image actually more accurately, what we do is we take lots of um, examples of that thing, perhaps, and compress them into, an in into a single instance. Or alternatively, we might take lots of um, moments in time and compress them into a single moment. One of the examples he uses, which I think is really clear, is the, um, is the way we tend to, to uh, understand evolution as if it was a single animal evolving over time. You know, there's that famous, um, very famous picture that's been done again and again, which shows the evolution of humans. And you get a little monkey at one end of it, and then different species of apes until you get a human at the far end. Almost as if it's a, these are separate frames in the same movie, you know, it's the same creature just growing. And there's an opening sequence in one of the Simpsons cartoons, which shows the evolution of, ultimately, of Homer Simpson, starting from a single cell. But it's the same creature that moves through, you know, so it's, it sprouts um, fins and then those fins mutate into arms and the legs and then it walks out of the water, and those kind of things. So what's happening in that is that um, all those different creatures over thousands and millions of years have been compressed into a single narrative, a single story. So there's still the creature, lots of different creatures, just a single creature mutating over time. Uh, and it's, uh, it's obviously in The Simpsons it's used for comic effect, but generally that's the kind of technique we use in order to be able to understand complex processes. That, that's one of the many techniques we use. Uh, I think in that particular case, actually, the, that, that kind of understanding, which is so useful, often leads to kind of misunderstandings, particularly of something like evolution. Because when you're using any kind of metaphor or a metonymy or something like that, there's always uh, some slippage between the source of your metaphor and the eventual target. You know, between what, between the ideas that you're trying to use and the way that the metaphor plays them out. You have to carry things over in the metaphor, what are called entailments, different aspects of the original thing, which don't, aren't really relevant. So, for example, in that one I just described, this. Um, evolution of life as if it's a single life form you know, transforming. That one, for example, um, carries over the idea of change. There's no, there isn't actually that kind of change taking place in any evolutionary process. You know, no, no animal grows gills like that or grows fins. Uh, but because that's carried over it can lead to misunderstandings and I think some of the more palpable mistakes that are made in kind of creationist understandings or at least presentations of evolution. Things that result in things like the crocoduck, you know, a very famous piece of creationist buffoonery. Um, are kind of the result of that really, you know, an incorrect carrying over, an incorrect um, set of entailments borne by the metaphor, by the metonymy, by the compression. Anyhow, that's a long way of talking about introducing what I really want to think about, which is to do with death, really, and extinction. Because the way we understand this, this word extinction, I think, is very particular, isn't it? You know, when a species goes extinct, or on the potential of uh, the eventual human extinction, that's understood, I think I'm right in saying, for the most part at least, as something bad. You know, we don't, want, we don't like the idea of things going extinct. We certainly don't like the idea of humans going extinct, even though, we, of course, we know that everything, including humans, will eventually go extinct. And we also know, in fact, that 99% of the animals that have ever been alive in the world are now extinct. We know that too, so we shouldn't be as, perhaps as surprised as we are by it, but nevertheless we are. And, uh, oops, I have to be quiet here for a sec. Yeah, I didn't really want to talk about human extinction while people were passing, but 
anyway um, so so even though it's extinction happens all the time it in fact is happening all the time now you know thousands of insects are going extinct as I speak uh, and smaller life forms and, and larger ones too but, um, but as I say we we tend to associate extinction with a negative thing and there's always moves against it we always try to archive uh, the last remaining members of particular species uh, and preserve DNA all those kind of things but I think I think that's because of a, a metonymic or a metaphorical compression that's taking place in our understanding of what extinction is because when we think about extinction I think we're imagining it like a death like an individual death in fact you know I've heard it discussed in, in pretty similar ways you know the as if as if going extinct is in, will involve suffering or will involve pain or will involve loss and sorrow but there's no real reason why it should uh, I mean everything undoubtedly that goes extinct that necessarily involves every single member of a particular species dying but there's no rest of no reason within that why they should die in unfortunate circumstances or badly <laughs> sorry the dog's just being a bit silly uh, so as I said there's not necessarily a correlation there you know but nevertheless, but, it's, it, 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 but I think the whole idea of extinction is what I'm saying. I think the whole idea of extinction is understood as a kind of death. We take all the individual examples, all the individual instances of individual deaths that make, that, make up that extinction moment and compress them into a single metonymic representation somehow in our understanding and then confer upon that the entailment of an individual death because individual deaths, you know, quite often do uh, happen in unfortunate circumstances. They do, they are preceded by a certain amount of suffering quite often, or frailty at the very least, uh, a loss of, resu of faculties, and perhaps also by grieving and sorrow and, and the rest of the kind of things that happen around a particular individual death. But those don't necessarily belong to extinction. Those are part of an individual person's death not of an extinction event and in fact most of the things that go extinct all these foliage here for example will undoubtedly go extinct and there will not be one moment of suffering anywhere in that extinction event because of course there's a plants and plants don't have nerve endings anyhow that's just something i'm thinking about right now while the sun bounces off the river foul below me and the wind picks up around me yeah we're not long for this world are we